All right. We're going to finish up 13 real quick. You know, last week we had talked about uh, chapter 13, and, you know, we had established, or at least I believe we had established, uh, verses uh, really 1 through uh, about 31, uh, at least in, in most part, or, or foretelling the destruction of Jerusalem. This is not about uh, the second coming. This is about the destruction of Jerusalem. And, and part of the, the language that we see is you will know uh, that, that, that is near, you'll know that it is about to happen because you will see these things, you will, you will understand that this is going to come. And then we get to verse 32, and it says, but concerning that day or that hour, no one knows. Not even the angels in heaven nor the Son, but only the Father. Be on guard, keep awake, for you do not know when the time will come. It is like a man going on a journey when he leaves home and puts his servants in charge, each his work, each with his work, and commands the doorkeeper to stay awake. Therefore, stay awake. For you do not know when the master of the house will come in the evening or at midnight or when the rooster crows or in the morning, lest he come suddenly and find you asleep. And what I say to you, I say to all, stay awake. Um, this section here, verse 32 through 37, uh, is talking about the second coming. This is, this is when Jesus will return in his glory. This is uh, when, when all will, will be at an end. This is the second coming. And we, we see the difference between this section and the previous in that you won't know when it's going to come. You won't know when it's going to be here. It'll come like a thief in the night, uh, some of the other uh, uh, gospel accounts say. And so there's a very clear difference. And so... Today, in today's society, you know, I've had people come up and say, you know, they, they find out I'm a Christian, you know, and like, well, you know, all these, all these wars and famines and all these things going on, don't you think that the, the end time is near? Don't you think that, that it's about to be, I, I don't know. <laughs> we don't know. We do not know when it is coming. And to look at the, the signs of the age and try to determine when God is going to send his son back is a foolhardy endeavor. We won't know. It's going to come at a day and a time and an hour when we are, are hopefully prepared, which is why he is saying, stay awake. We have a responsibility to serve God every day of our lives, every hour of our lives, every minute of our lives, because ultimately we don't know when he's coming back. But when he does come back, all will be said, all will be done, that will be it. It will be final. And if we're not ready when he comes back, we're not ready. So, as Jesus has said, stay awake. Specifically while I'm preaching and teaching today. Don't sleep. Chapter 14, verse 1. It was now two days before the Passover... And the feast of unleavened bread, and the chief priests and the scribes were seeking how to arrest him by stealth and kill him. For they said, not during the feast, lest there be an uproar from the people. Uh, you know, the, the disciples of Jesus, they, they, they wanted to spend time with him. They enjoyed spending time with him. They enjoyed learning from him. But the chief priests, the scribes, the Pharisees, they, they did not. <laughs> they were threatened by him. They were uh, unhappy with him. And in fact, they were so unhappy, they wanted to kill him. Now, I, I want you to consider in your life for a second, your, your mortal enemy, the one person who you just cannot stand. Have you ever genuinely considered taking a life the level of hatred, the level of animosity that, that must be present for you to say, we're going to kill this person. These scribes, these, these chief priests, these Pharisees, they, so much hatred. And during the Feast of Unleavened Bread, during a time when they're to be giving honor and, and and, and praise and glory to God, they are they're thinking about how they're going to take life, how they're going to kill. 
During a time when they ought to be praising the Lord, they are considering how they're going to kill the Lord. It's a sad state when we allow hatred, animosity, those those negative emotions to enter our heart in such a degree, really at all, but certainly in such a degree that we are willing to murder. Let us never be like that. Jesus has called us to love one another, has he not? To be kind to one another. He says, you will know, you will know you are my disciples by the fruit that you bear, that you have love for one another, not hatred, not animosity, love. Verse 3. While he was in Bethany in the house of Simon the leper, as he was reclining at table, a woman came with an alabaster flask of ointment of pure nard, very costly. And she broke the flask and poured it over his head. There were some who said to themselves indignantly, why was the ointment wasted like that? For this ointment could have been sold for more than 300 denarii and given to the poor. And they scolded her. But Jesus said, leave her Alone, Why do you trouble her? She has done a beautiful thing to me. For you always have the poor with you. And whenever you want, you can do good for them, but you will not always have me. She has done what she could. She has anointed my body beforehand for burial. And truly, I say to you, wherever the gospel is proclaimed in the whole world, what she has done will be told in memory of her Is that not true? Are we not telling right now, 2,000 years later, what this woman has done for the Christ? Because we are talking about the, the, the gospel, the life of Christ, we get to talk about this woman who had an alabaster flask of ointment, very costly. It says that she could have sold it for 300 denarii. How much is that worth? Anybody? It's, it's about a year's salary. So a, a, denari, a denarii is about a, a day's wages. And this could have been sold for, for more than 300 denarii. So, I mean, you're talking about a perfume bottle worth a year's salary. Let's consider the, uh, at least what I recall to be the median wage of uh, U.S. individuals, about, uh, I think now, 40-something thousand across the United States, 40 something thousand dollars. Can you imagine buying a bottle of perfume for close to $40,000? And then, in one day, at one time, you, you break it, and you pour it over somebody's head. That would seem an extravagant waste, would it not? An extravagant waste. I, I don't mean, maybe not for you. Maybe you guys have $40,000 just laying around the house. <laughs> we, we don't have forty grand laying around. <laughs> it's not hidden under our mattress or anything. I guess maybe we need to go look at home tonight. Forty grand, 300 denarii worth. And and she breaks it and pours it over the head of Jesus. Is it any wonder that these disciples started to scold her? What might you have done? I, I feel like that's a very rational thing to do. But Jesus understands what's happening, doesn't he? Because he's, you know, he's Jesus. He, he, he understands that this is, this is him being prepared for burial. And so he says, leave her alone. Why do you trouble her? He rebukes these disciples. He rebukes them. She has done a beautiful thing for me. You know, the, the argument was, well, we, we could have given this to the poor. We could have taken this money and we could have really helped the poor. Absolutely, you could have but you can do that tomorrow. 
And you can do that the next day and you can do that next year. You can do that at any point because Jesus said the poor will always be with you. You will always have the poor. Now this is, is, is really another, at least to me, another sign of his, his deity. In the richest country in the world, the United States, I guess maybe China has surpassed our GDP now, but regard, no, it has not. Okay, I got to, from over here. The richest country in the world, the United States, there are still poor people here. Just think about that. The United States has been around since 1776. I believe that's correct. Or a Declaration of Independence was signed then. We still have poor people. Do you know there are still poor people in Israel? There are still poor people the world over. You would think that after 2,000 years, society would have figured out a way to make people not poor, huh? That we could, we could figure out how to get people food, and we can get people clothing, we can get people shelter. You would think that as a society would have figured that out by now. But what does Jesus say? No, you will always have the poor. It's striking to me that Jesus doesn't say our responsibility is to eliminate poverty from the world. Our responsibility is to love people. Our responsibility is to care for people. Our responsibility is to proclaim the gospel to people. Because whether we live in a mansion or a shack, whether we have food or we don't, we are responsible for serving God first and foremost. It is not about the things that we have in this life. It is not about the possessions. It is not about the, the, the amount of money that we have. That is not what this life is about. A couple of Sundays ago, I made the statement, uh, you know, John Lennon, his, his quote to his teacher, he was asked, what do you want to be when you grow up? And he said, happy. And, you know, she said, you don't understand the assignment. He said, you don't understand life. We're not here to be happy. We're here to serve the Lord. We're not here on this earth to have possessions. We're here to serve the Lord. If we have possessions, great. And if we don't, great. Paul says, in all things, I have learned to trust in God, right? In all things, whether by, whether by poverty or whether by extravagance and excessive wealth, we ought to learn in all things to be able to serve the Lord. Any thoughts, comments so far before we move forward? All right. Uh, verse 10 and 11. Judas Iscariot, who was one of the 12, went to the chief priests in order to betray him to them. And when they heard it, they were glad and promised to give him money, and he sought an opportunity to betray him. Judas was really a common name in this day. You know, today we associate the name Judas with a betrayer of betrayers, right? We, nobody would dare name their child Judas, right? Unless you just really did not like your child for whatever reason. You just wouldn't do it. But Judas was actually a relatively common name. You know, we've talked uh, recently, at least I think it's been recently, about Judas Maccabeus, right? The, um, the Maccabean Revolt. Well, the Maccabean Revolt was in part started by a man named Judas, whose entire goal was to bring back temple worship in the proper manner. And so the name Judas has a, has a really bad rap because of this guy, because of this man right here, who sold the Lord, who sold the Lord's life for 30 pieces of silver that may have been worth about five to six months' wages. It's no meager amount, but it's also what price are you willing to sell the Lord for? 60 pieces of silver, a whole year's wages? What are you going to sell God for? I, I don't think any of us would give up the Lord. I hope not. 
But Judas had allowed greed to enter his heart. And so he goes to the chief priest because he knows they're trying to kill him. He knows they're trying to get rid of him. And so what better way to get rid of Jesus? What better way to, to, to acquire money? You know, that 300 denarii worth of flask, that alabaster flask of ointment that was just broken and, and could have been given to the poor. Why do you think Judas was upset about that? Was it because it was not going to the poor, or was it because it wasn't going to his pockets? There's absolutely some greed there. The desire to, to earn money. And so he goes to the chief priests, and they, they heard it, and they were glad. Can you, it, it, just, it still blows my mind that there are people in this world that are happy to kill. A plot comes about, and, and they, they know that they're able to take somebody out to kill somebody, and, and they're excited about it. These, these, these lovers of God, these chief priests, these servants of God, who were there to lead the people to be closer to the Lord, who understood the Ten Commandments, thou shalt not murder, were happy we're glad that they finally had an opportunity to kill him. It is just mind-blowing to me. And we get to the Passover. On the first day of unleavened bread, when they sacrificed the Passover lamb, his disciples said to him, where will you have us go and prepare for you to eat the Passover? And he sent two of his disciples and said to him, said to them, go into the city, and a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him, and wherever he enters, say to the master of the house, the teacher says, where is my guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? And he will show you a large upper room furnished and ready. There prepare for us. And the disciples set out and went to the city and found it just as he had told them. And they prepared the Passover. Let's, let's talk about this for a second. Um, you know, it's just the first day of unleavened bread, first day of the Passover. Uh, and, and as disciples, they're, they're wondering, where are we going to eat this meal? What are we, how are we going to celebrate the Passover? Which was a very important thing at this time. It's a very important thing at this time. And so he sends two of his disciples. He doesn't tell the group that we are told. Uh, it, it seems that this is more of a, uh, uh, not secretive, but also not for everybody to hear. There's two disciples that go into the city, and he tells them what they're going to find. You're going to find a man carrying a jar of water, and when you, you will meet, he will meet you, and you're going to follow him. So you're, you're just going to follow him, and whenever he enters his house... Uh, you're going to say to the master of the house, the teacher says, where is my guest room? Now, some have, have speculated, of course, that um, Jesus had met this man prior and had talked with him and had set this up and arranged this to happen. I, no. <laughs> this is Jesus. This is the Lord who knows all things, is aware of all things. He knew what these disciples would find. And he shows yet again his deity, his omniscience. As he tells these disciples, go into the city. You will find a man carrying a jar of water. Now, the second question that must be asked, um, I guess I'll ask this of you. How many of you have an upper room ready and furnished to have a meal? I'm ready to, Listen, and I are ready to go and eat. How many of you all are able to have us? Like right, right now, now, today. Nobody? Well, that's a shame. The Jewish brethren, the Jewish people at this time, generally speaking, were told if they had room, if they had the availability, that they were to prepare for guests, especially during the Passover, because who entered the city during this time? Jews from where? Everywhere. They traveled from all over. Where, did, where were they going to stay? Are they going to stay at the inns? Are they going to stay on the streets? No. 
We gotta stay with people. And so this room was furnished and ready to go because it was the time of the Passover, because he knew, these people knew the people were coming in. Now what's interesting is what the disciples were to say to the master of the house. The teacher says, Right? These two disciples are coming in on behalf of Jesus. It says, the teacher says, where is my guest room where I meet the Passover with my disciples? It seems that the master of house knows who this is. He knows who the teacher is. And he welcomes him with open arms, welcomes him into the house. Let's move forward a little more. Verse 17, when it was evening, he came with the 12, and as they were reclining at table and eating, Jesus said, truly, I say to you, one of you will betray me. One who is eating with me. He began to be sorrowful, and to say to him one after another, is it I? He said to them, it is one of the 12, one who is dipping bread into the dish with me. For the Son of Man goes as it is written of him. But woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been better for that man if he had not been born. Yeah, this, this section always, I don't know if confuses me is the right phrase, but you've got these disciples all reclining at table, right? And, you know, Corey in the past has talked about uh, how they would have these, these you know, I, I guess seats that would extend out and, and tables there, and they would be able to actually kind of lay down on one arm or lay down to the side to recline at the table. And then as they're doing this, you know, maybe they've, uh, you know, they're, they're, they're relaxing, right? They're getting ready to, to eat the Passover meal. He says, one of you will betray me, one who is eating with me, which is, which is already a uh, kind of a scary statement, right? You hear that and you're, whoa. <laughs> That's a bold statement, Jesus. You know, <laughs> I'm not, not going to betray you. We know that Peter, Peter said, I will go with you even to death, right? But in verse 19, it says, they began to be sorrowful. Well, who's included in that they? Judas. Judas is included in that they. He is a part of this. And it says, they began to say to him one after the other, is it I? I wonder, I really wonder what Judas was thinking, what he was feeling, what was going through his mind as he's sitting there with all of these other disciples, himself knowing he was going to betray him, right? Because we recall in verse 11, he sought an opportunity to betray him. And Jesus then says, one of you will betray me. Judas knows that it's him. And all of these disciples, they go around the table, is it I? Is it I? And then you get to Judas, and I, I just, I wonder, is, is it I? Do you know it's me? Can you think of how many times Judas had a chance to repent? To turn back? To not do what he did? To not betray the Son of Man? Jesus says, woe to that man. It would have been better for that man if he had not been born. I don't ever want to be in a position or a situation where I am betraying the Son of God. Where I am giving up my faith in Him for anything else. As if anything else could even come close to being worthy of Jesus Christ. Of God, of the Gospel. Verse 22, as they were eating, he took bread, and after blessing it, broke it, and gave it to them, and said, take, this is my body. All right, real quick, let's make sure we know, is the bread the literal body of Christ? Are we talking about transubstantiation? No. It is symbolic of his body. He took the cup, when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, they all drank of it. And he said to them, this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many. Truly, 
I say to you, I will not drink again of the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. Now, there are uh, those in, in this world who believe that the, uh, when they partake of the Lord's Supper, um, that it becomes the literal body and the literal blood of, of Jesus. That, that is not at all what Jesus is talking about. This is a symbolic taking, uh, and he is establishing it here on the Passover so that they might understand that the Lord's Supper, which they are to take every week, as we see in Acts 19, the brethren do that, uh, Acts chapter 2 at the end, verses 43 through 47, they're all gathering together and taking bread, eating, uh, eating bread together, that, that they are weekly remembering the sacrifice of Christ, the sacrifice of Jesus. When we remember the Lord's Supper, here in about an hour, a little less than, we have the wonderful opportunity to focus our minds, to consider what Jesus has done for us. That he gave his life for us. He gave his body, he shed his blood, he gave everything for us. When we partake of the Lord's Supper, let us do so in a manner certainly that is pleasing to God, but remembering everything he has done. The sacrifice that he gave because he died for us. He didn't die for himself. He died for us. He gave his life for us. And Jesus wanted his disciples to remember that, to know that, and he wants us to remember and to know that. All right, before uh, we move forward, any, any more thoughts? got 14 minutes to get through the rest of the chapter. <laughs> All right. Verse 26. When they had sung a hymn, I think we often kind of overlook that, don't we? They're at the Passover, they're sharing a meal together, and what are they doing? They're singing. They're praising God. When they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives, and Jesus said to them, you will all fall away. For it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. But after I am raised up, I will go before you to Galilee. Peter said to him, even though they all fall away, I will not. That's a bold statement, isn't it, Peter? You think he believed that? Do you think Peter believed that he was going to stay true to the Lord? Absolutely. Absolutely he believed it. But I think he had a different perspective in his mind of how things were about to unfold, didn't he? Because they believed that the, the, the Messiah was going to bring about an earthly kingdom again. And so he's ready. We see he's ready because here in a little bit, he's going to pull out his sword and he's, he's ready to fight. Outnumbered, outgunned, outmanned, he's ready to fight because he believes in Jesus Christ, that this, this new kingdom is coming and he's going to be right there with Jesus. I will not deny you, Lord. Jesus said to him, truly, I tell you, this very night, before the rooster crows twice, not only will you deny me, Peter, you will deny me three times. But he said emphatically, Peter, right here, he's, Jesus has said something. This is the word of God, right? I and mean, what God says is what happens. Peter has seen this all throughout. And here he says, no, Jesus, you're wrong. If I must die with you, I will not deny you. Even if I have to die, I won't deny you. And they all said the same. They went to a place called Gethsemane. He said to his disciples, sit here while I pray. He took with him Peter and James and John and 
began to be greatly distressed and troubled. He said to them, my soul is very sorrowful even to death. Remain here and watch. Let's consider for a second your spouse, your parents, children. They come to you and they tell you, I am, I am sorrowful, I am distressed. I, I need you to just wait here and watch in case something happens. Because I, 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 I've got to go pray, I'm, I'm anxious, I, I, I can't. I need you to just stay and watch. Can you do that? What's your response? Absolutely sure, yes. Absolutely, I will watch. I will. And what are we going to do? Are we going to? We're going to watch, aren't we? We're going to stay awake. It might be two or three in the morning, and we're going to do everything in our power to do what? To stay awake, to watch, to be there for them, because that's what they need from us. They need us to be there for them, to watch. Jesus said, "My soul is very sorrowful, even to death." Do you think Jesus was in distress here? Our Lord was in distress, and, and who did he bring along with Peter and James and John, and what did he need from them? He needed one thing. Watch. Stay awake. That's what I need from you. Stay awake. Going a little further, he fell on the ground and pray that if it were possible, the hour might pass from him. Jesus did not want to go through what he was about to go through. He did not want to be crucified. He knew it was coming. He knew what was going to happen. But he said, if it is possible, Lord, we know from the other accounts, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. He said it. Abba, Father, Father, Father. He's, he's crying out to God, to his Father, whom, whom he has been with since the creation of time. All things are possible for you. Remove this cup from me, yet not what I will, but what you will. He's praying and, and he's, he's talking to the Lord. He's, he's prostrate on the ground. He has fallen to the ground and he is, he's praying that he doesn't have to go through with this. Lord, if there's anything you can do, please do it. If there's any way to remove this from me, please remove it from me. I don't want to have to go through with this, but I will if it's your will. He came and found them sleeping. Not much in the scriptures is sadder than that. Jesus has needed one thing from his friends at this point in time. He's needed them to watch, to stay awake, to be there for him. And he comes, he's sorrowful to death. I mean, you, you, we've heard his prayer. We know what he's praying for. And he comes and his disciples, they're just, they're sleeping. If you ask your family member to watch with you, to wait for you, to be there for you, and you go and you pray for, for an hour and you're, you're on the ground and you are giving your heart to the Lord and you walk back knowing, man, my, my spouse, my, my father, my mother, my friends, they'll be there waiting for me and you come and you find them sleeping. What do you think? They must not care. You're going to feel alone, aren't you? Utterly alone. He found them sleeping. He said to Peter, Simon, are you asleep? Could you not watch one hour? You couldn't stay awake for one hour for me? Watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Again, he went away and prayed, saying the same words. And again, he came and found them sleeping, for their eyes were heavy, and they did not know what to answer him. They had fallen asleep again. They 
and fall asleep again. And he comes back and he, are y'all sleeping again? They don't know what they want to say. What do you say at this point? He came the third time and said to them, are you still sleeping and taking your rest? Is this, is this what you're going to do right now? It's enough. You've, you've slept enough. You've rested enough. The hour has come. It is time you could have been waiting and watching for me and with me. This time, the, the, these last few hours you had on earth with me, the time has come. This is it. The Son of Man is betrayed and the hands of sinners rise. Let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. <clears throat> Immediately, while he was still speaking, Judas came, one of the twelve, and with him a crowd with swords and clubs. From the chief priests and the scribes and the elders, now the betrayer had given them a sign, saying, The one I will kiss is the man. Seize him and lead him away under guard. How embarrassing is not the right word. What, what is a kiss used for universally? A sign of affection. A sign of love. A sign of care. You go and you, somebody kisses you on the forehead or on the cheek. You know, that person cares about that person. You know, Paul even says in some of his letters, we're to greet each other with a holy kiss. A kiss is a, it's a universal sign of affection. Judas In, in, in such great hypocrisy, in so many ways, comes up and kisses Jesus in order to let them know this, this is who you want. Judas said, seize him and lead him away under guard. When he came, he went up to him at once and said, Rabbi. There's an exclamation point there. I, I assume that... <laughs> Judas comes up and says, teacher, rabbi, my Lord, and then kisses him, acts, acts as if he's excited. And Verse 46, they laid hands on him and seized him. One of those who stood by drew his sword and struck the servant of the high priest and cut off his ear. How many of you think he was aiming for the ear? He was aiming for the head. Peter is who we know it was, other accounts, was aiming for this man's head. The high priest had quick enough reflexes, though, <laughs> to, to dodge just enough. And all he lost was an ear. And even that was restored back to him. Jesus said to them, have you come out as against a robber? Am I a common criminal? with swords and clubs to capture me. Day after day, I was with you in the temple teaching. You did not seize me, but let the scriptures be fulfilled. And they all left him and fled. And a young man followed him with nothing but a linen cloth about his body, and they seized him. But he left the linen cloth and ran away naked. What an interesting a uh, little section there that we have. It's not in any of the other gospel accounts. It's presumably Mark that did this. He had followed after Jesus to see what was going on, but when they saw him, caught him, grabbed him by the cloth, he ran away naked. We don't know exactly who it is, but given that not a name is mentioned, it's at least likely that it is Mark, the author of the account. All right, we have two minutes to make it through Jesus before the council. <laughs> so that's not going to happen. Um, any thoughts, questions, comments, concerns, anything about what we have gone over today so far? <laughs> so throughout the last few chapters, we've seen that the high priest, the, the, the chief 
Pharisees, all of them, they're, they're trying to, to get Jesus. But who are they afraid of? They're afraid of the people, right? They're afraid of, of the people rising up against them because the only time that people have power is when they are afforded to it by the people, right? That's it. Governments have power because the people that are being ruled or governed by the government are allowing that power to exist. And so the chief priests have power because the people are allowing them to have that power. But they all perceived, all of the people perceived that Jesus was a prophet, right? That he was something special, that he was, he was greater than just your average ordinary Jewish man, this was a man who had the word of God with him, who was sent from God, he performed miracles, he did all of these things, the people loved him, the people adored him, and so they couldn't do this in broad daylight, they couldn't do this in a way where, where people could see what was happening, they had to do it in such a way where later they could twist and spin and turn whatever they wanted and said, well no, he did this, and so he was arrested, and so they needed a time where it was dark, it's quiet, nobody else was around, and in order for that to happen, they needed somebody on the inside. And so they paid Judas Iscariot. So in Zechariah chapter 11, beginning in verse 4, you have the 30 pieces of silver, and to answer the question, it was to pay yeah. for what was agreeable to be done that no one wanted to do. It was a payment for waiting. Yeah. So the, the statement from Brother, Brother Goins is that in Zechariah, was it 4? 11, that's what I said. Um, you have this section of scripture that says 30 pieces of silver will be given, right? And it was a payment for wages, something that they didn't want to do that needed to be done, according to the Pharisees, according to the scripture, that it might be fulfilled. And so it was payment for wages. So I hope that that helps. Um, thank you all for your time. Here in just a minute, we get to hear from Brother, Brother Joshua. I'm excited. <laughs>